Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, May 25th, 2006. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. We continue our interview this week with Andy Sparks, owner of the Home Brewery in Fayetteville, Arkansas, on basic extract home brewing equipment. In this part of our conversation, we move on from the absolutely necessary to the stuff that you technically don't really need but probably should have. Last week's show generated a couple of suggestions from Steve in Sacramento, California. Steve says, I was listening to your last podcast on basic equipment and had a tip for you on cleaning a glass carboy. Steve says, the dry croissant is indeed a problem to clean. I use a good amount of chlorine bleach, about two to three times what is needed for sanitization, and fill the fermenter to the top and leave it overnight to scour the glass clean. By morning, Steve says, you could read a copy of the new complete joy of home brewing through the carboy. (laughs) A good hot water rinse with a bottle washer, jet, and it's about as clean as you can get. Steve says, by the way, that book is also a piece of basic equipment on my list for anyone interested in brewing. Your DVDs are great, but that book is is still a goldmine of information for us all. Well, thanks for the compliment, Steve, and I, I agree that Charlie Papazian's book is pretty much standard equipment. Came with, in fact, it came with my equipment kit uh, 10 years ago or so. I would also add John Palmer's How to Brew, uh, Ray Daniels' Designing Great Beers, and if you want uh, good resources for recipes, Mark and Tess Samatulski's books Clone Brews and Beer Captured are also good. And, of course, there are many, many other great books out there, and uh, I'm sure that we'll uh, interview some of those authors over time. And one one more note, if you do use a lot of bleach in your carboy to scour it clean, as uh, Steve suggests, be sure to rinse thoroughly several times to get the bleach residue out of there, especially if you use um, a stronger concentration than just what is used for sanitization. Now, on the DVDs, we always say buy our DVDs to... uh, see us, to watch us walk you through the process. We feel it's the least intimidating way to learn uh, home brewing, uh, both extract and all grain. Then read the books to get more detail, and uh, you'll know better what they're talking about because you've seen it done. Uh, Steve continues, another tip for basic equipment. I use an inexpensive digital thermometer available from any homebrew store or any home store to measure the temperatures of my mash, the one used for meat with a long flexible metal cable can be floated in a cork to measure the temps accurately and even give an alarm if the temperatures get too high. He says, cheap, accurate, and easy to use. Can't beat it. Again, I agree with Steve. Um, I don't use a digital thermometer for mashing myself, but I have been using one in monitoring the fermentation of the Belgian blonde ale that I'm uh, in the middle of making right now. Um, I wanted to follow Stan Hieronymus's advice, the author of uh, Brew Like a Monk, uh, to start the fermentation off cool and allow it to warm over time. So I dangled the probe of the uh, thermometer into the beer and sealed it in there using a rubber carboy cap that has two openings. I used uh, one for the thermometer probe and the other for the airlock. Uh, that way I could check the temperature any time I wanted to. I, all I needed to do was just turn on the electronic thermometer. It should be more accurate than a thermometer strip that you stick on the outside of the carboy since there's no barrier between the beer and the thermometer. By the way, I started this Belgian Blonde in the basement, which is about 60 degrees Fahrenheit. That's about 15 C. I chilled the wort to 68 degrees F or 20 degrees C at pitching, and the beer fermented in the mid-60s for about three days. Now, I think I waited too long to move it upstairs into the warmer house, though, Um, By the time I moved it upstairs, it was pretty much done with the primary fermentation, so I guess I missed out on the the warm-up in the fermentation. Uh, However, I racked it into a secondary yesterday, and it tasted great. It it may not be as fruity as I'd hoped, but I'm sure it will still be good. And my plans next are to put the secondary into a cooler with ice to crash the yeast before I bottle it, and I'll, I'll keep you updated on how that's going. Now, back to the equipment discussion. Paul in Houghton, Michigan, who is one of the listeners requesting these equipment shows, writes, Personally, I think that plastic buckets as primary fermenters are a great idea. The amount of foam and yeast generated during that period is incredible. 
and much easier to deal with in a light, inexpensive bucket. Uh, Paul continues, I second the concern over broken carboys because it is easy to sever an artery if they break. This danger is very real for my wife, whose college friend died as a result of injuries sustained while cleaning a fish tank. Think about that. As a result, I decided to purchase Better Bottles, a product called Better Better Bottles, for most of my secondary fermentation. Uh, Paul says they are supposedly light, strong, gas-tight, easy to clean, and can be fitted with all manner of racking gadgets. Hopefully this is the case. Well, that's a tragic story about the friend who died cleaning the fish tank. Uh, Apparently, uh, Paul says the tank broke and... uh, the friend severed an artery in his leg, and he passed away before he could get help. Like I say, very tragic. Uh, a friend of mine uh, cut her arm severely when she tripped and fell through a coffee table with a glass top. Now, she's okay. It happened several years ago, but it just is just a reminder. We tend to forget how dangerous glass can be. So thanks for the reminder, Paul, and let us know how the better bottles work for you. Michael from Rollinsforth, New Hampshire, writes in and says, You might want to mention on your show that anyone who has the smart idea to sterilize their carboy in the oven might want to remember that the temperature sticker on it isn't meant to get too hot. (laughs) He says, Just learned that lesson. Uh, I guess Michael's referring to one of those stick-on thermometers. Um, It sounds sounds like a mess, uh, Michael. Uh, You might want to be um, very careful uh, in heating glass carboys or bottles in the oven, uh, if you do decide to do that, uh, if you'll remember, as someone who uh, works with uh, glass as a hobby told us in an earlier show, you want to heat it up slowly and cool it down slowly. Uh, I myself have never used the oven to sterilize glass, so I'm definitely not an expert in this area, like I'm an expert in any area. <laughs> If you'll remember from a couple weeks ago, Mike from Whalen, Massachusetts, wrote in to say that he was inspired by our six-pack IPA episode to split a five-gallon batch into separate one-gallon beers that were single-hopped with different American hop varieties. So it gets five different beers out of one uh, batch of wort. Well, I received an email this week from Larry in Laguna Niguel, California, saying that he and his brewing buddy Ryan with assistance from Ryan's wife, uh, Divya, or Divya, have done a similar experiment with 12 small batches. Same wort, uh, divided and hopped with 12 different hop varieties, or I guess I should say same wort recipe. Larry says they brewed eight of the batches one day and four the next. He says they're dry hopping them now and plan to taste them with several tasting sessions. Larry says they don't want to do them all at one time, and I can understand why. That's a lot to ask of the taste buds. Well, that's that's great. I think that's excellent. Um, I applaud the efforts of both Mike and Larry and his buddies. They're all going to they're they're going to come out with a better appreciation and understanding of hops and how they they affect the beer's taste. But wait, there's more. Not to be outdone, uh, Mike from Wayland says he wants to do a similar experiment with Belgians and different sugars. Mike says, inspired by your interview with the author of Brew Like a Monk, which I read a while back, I just placed an order for supplies to do a variable sugar experiment. I'm thinking of doing a light Pilsner base with Belgian yeast and just enough European hops for balance. I'm really interested to, interested to see how good the recently made available candy sugar syrup is. Uh, Mike says, at this point, I think my five batches will be dark candy syrup, Dark Candy Rocks, Unrefined Sugar, either Muscovado or Turbinado, Homemade Caramel, and Refined White Sugar as the control. Mike says doubles are one of my favorite uh, styles, so hopefully this will send me in a good direction for formulating recipes. Wow. Now, I feel like I'm falling behind here. I need to, <laughs> I need to get in the kitchen and start playing playing with ingredients and, and beers and, and get some more experiments going. I'm inspired by these guys who were inspired by our uh, IPA, uh, six-pack IPA batch. Uh, I'll put a link to the uh, picture of the 12-batch experiment from Larry and his friends in the description of this episode on basicbrewingradio.com. It's an impressive shot with uh, 12 little uh, fermenting vessels uh, with the blow-off tubes all leading into a central uh, 
bucket of water, I guess, or, or some some liquid there. Uh, so very good guys, very uh, I- inspiring, like I say. And uh, I'm interested to see how those experiments come out. Please keep us uh, abreast of uh, how that comes out, both of those, uh, or all three, I guess, with the uh, sugar as well. Okay, now on to our interview. We continue our chat with Andy Sparks on the next level of basic homebrewing equipment. Well, Andy, it's been so long since we've gotten together. It's good to <laughs> it's good to finally see you again, James. <laughs> well, welcome back. Or I, I thank you for welcoming us again into your store. I do that every time. That's okay. You and all your listeners are welcome in here anytime. <laughs> yeah, there's a chair over there for you. Evan. <laughs> and we're, we've moved on to a second homebrew of mine, the Amarillo Ale, which Andy says doesn't have enough hop aroma. He's probably right. Well, you know, something when you, when you name it after the hops, you know, I, I kind of expect to get the hops in the nose right off the bat, but... And lately, I've been drinking a lot of beers with a lot of hop aroma. So. Yeah, you with your dogfish head uh, shirt on, <laughs> straight from uh, the Washington area, where you drank some big old dogfish head beers. Yep, uh, and it was uh, delicious. I got uh, got to have some 90 minute on tap in uh, Gaithersburg, Maryland, at the dogfish. I think it's the tap room up there. They don't brew there, but uh, they do have a, a branch a facility there in Gaithersburg. Also had some wonderful food and some some really nice people there to take care of us. So mm. we had a good time. And as a matter of fact, I was wearing your T-shirt at the at the Dogfish Head Pub. Oh, well, thank and, you. And uh, a group of people behind us noticed it and uh, got my attention. And uh, we talked a little bit about the show. So, so hopefully positive. Very positive. <laughs> very positive. And along those same lines, I should also add that uh, on my trip out to Washington D.C., I. Uh, I got the chance to spend a little more time listening to some of your other podcasts, and you know, in my line of work, I don't actually get to get to do as much of that as I'd like to. So, but I really, it's a wonderful thing to be able to take a plane ride somewhere and spend a couple hours with you and, and, and your guests, <laughs> and and uh, and think about home brewing. And, and of course, every time I listen to you on the show, I want to go home and brew. <laughs> so. I always get thirsty. Yeah, so thanks. Telling these people about these wonderful beers. Well, thank you, Andy. That's very, very nice of you to say that. And I appreciate all your help and support. Um, <clears throat> but I, I did want to mention that I, this next batch of the Samarillo Ale I'm going to make, um, I mentioned uh, in the interview with the Mark and Tess uh, Samatulski uh, on hops that in the uh, latest, or at least the latest at this time, uh, uh, issue of uh, Zymergy has an article by uh, Jamil uh, Zainshef on late hopping. In the next version of this beer, I'm going to lay off the hops until the last 20 minutes and then maybe double or triple the amount of hops going in there okay. and so that I can get the same amount of bitterness but just pump up the, the, aroma, and the, the aroma, aroma and the flavor. There's some really good interviews that uh, Jamil had well, in that article. So it's uh, It's interesting. There's a lot of techniques you know i've been doing this for what 12 15 years something like that and in the last couple of years there's been some techniques that have come on that uh are really it's really fresh and nice to see some new things coming around and mm-hmm. you know, for a long time we pretty much did the same things and and now you have this the plethora of these gigantic pale ales and everybody trying to show off their latest hop creation and and uh this thing like this late hopping and and other things like the continuous hopping. There's so many neat things going on right now uh, with the American wild ales and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, it's just a wonderful time to be drinking beer in America. <laughs> well, let's uh, let's pick up where we left off uh, our last conversation. Uh, we're talking about equipment, and I've gotten some emails from people saying, <clears throat> talk more about the equipment of home brewing. And, you know, I thought, and I had some requests to start with the basics because people want to get into the mm-hmm. hobby and you want to know exactly what they want to get. And we last time we, we talked about <clears throat> the absolute necessary things that you'll you'll need for home brewing. Now let's move it let's let's move up a step to things that aren't absolutely necessary, but really are on the border, mm-hmm. a lot of these things. Well, I know what the first one on your list is going to be. I know what the first one on my list would be, and that would be a wart chiller. Ah, yeah. 
Yep. So uh, that's something that you don't necessarily have to have mm. out of the gate, but once you get one, you won't know how you did without it. Uh, <laughs> you know, when you, you you make beer, you have to bring basically uh, a syrup or a syrup, as you <laughs> you point out the different <laughs> pronunciations regularly. Uh, you, you bring this very sweet, thick liquid to a boil, um, and then you need to get it back to room temperature. And and something that's thick like that. Uh, doesn't give up its heat readily. You know, mm. it, it tends to keep the heat, and uh, so it's difficult to cool it down to room temperature. Uh, you you can do it a bunch of different ways. People talk about doing ice baths, and uh, where you stick your 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 brew pot down in a in a tub full of ice, um, uh, or draping a damp towel over it, and uh, and then blowing a fan on it, stuff like that. But all these methods are really take way too long um and the truth is during this time from when you shut the heat off till you get the yeast started your beer is the most vulnerable vulnerable it will ever be and so the the trick to making good fresh beer and when i say fresh beer i mean beer that tastes fresh and clean uh free from infections is to get it from the boiling point to the pitching point as fast as possible and then throwing a lot of very healthy, viable yeast at it so that it can get kicked off and it is the dominant microorganism working in your beer. Um, and the, the trick to that and the thing that most uh, home brewers uh, find is the use of uh, wort chiller, which is basically a, uh, a heat exchanger. Um, it's a copper coil uh, that you uh, submerge in your hot wort and you pass cold tap water through this this coil uh, and as you pass the water through the coil it will draw the heat off of the the the, the wort and you can easily bring uh, a batch of beer from the boiling temperature down to pitching temperature in around 20 minutes yeah. which is a dramatic increase <clears throat> over ice bath method or the weight uh, just put the lid on and wait which could take you know four or five hours or longer depending on the volume Correct, but yeah, it, and it depends on the it depends on the time of year, it depends on the temperature of the cold water coming out of your faucet. In the winter time, you know, you could you could theoretically bring down, you could certainly bring two and a half gallons of wort down in like fifteen minutes, probably. Right, right. In the summertime, it may take twice as long as that. Right, but the truth is, most most of the water is is coming from pipes that are buried in the ground, so. Typically, your tap water, you, you know, the cold water will be around 60 degrees, which, you know, um, it, it's much better than letting it sit mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, letting it just cool down on its own. Uh, you know, our kitchens and our houses are full of microorganisms and, and microflora that can get in, in there, and it only takes one <laughs> to, to spoil a batch of beer. So... Uh, the trick is get it chilled as quickly as possible and get a healthy uh, yeast, uh, viable yeast started in it. And when we've had discussions <clears throat> back and forth on this show about the no-chiller method of people boiling the wort and leaving it overnight and then mm -hmm. pitching the next day. But, you know, like you said, it's just it just would take just a few organ microorganisms in there to, to jump in there and really take hold. And right. And, uh, and get a hold of the, the beer before your yeast has a chance to get in there. Right. It's not something that's going to hurt you, but it's going to hurt the taste of your beer. Right. And that is uh, if you listen to the shows that we did about the uh, the off flavors mm -hmm. in the beer, the, uh, the taste panel <laughs> thing, one of them was a beer that wasn't pitched fast enough, mm -hmm. that it had mm -hmm. that sweet, I describe it as, as bad iced tea, Um uh, people that aren't from the south of the uh, United States haven't run into this probably, but, uh, you know, a lot of places will serve iced tea. They <laughs> they sweeten it, and then it, sometimes it sits around for a little while, and it has this sweet, funky taste that <laughs> I've tasted in home brews as well. And, you know, from the panel that we, that we did, uh, I think the description of it was, you know, uh, mm -hmm. getting it fermented, getting it started late. So... Now you described the uh, one type of chiller, the immersion chiller. Right. There's also the counterflow chiller, right. where you where you kind of reverse the process. You run the wort through a copper pipe, 
Mm-hmm. And that that runs inside of either a garden hose that's been modified or another copper pipe mm-hmm. where the, the cold water goes in the opposite direction of the... I think it's the... I, yeah, I have an immersion is. chiller is. still, yeah. so... Um, <clears throat> so it that works faster than an immersion chiller, um, but it's and it's kind of a step up from from that the counterflow chiller. Right. Um, you know the the first one you're talking about immersion, um, which is just a copper coil that we immerse into our wart. Um, the counterflow chiller is more like the the kind of a heat. Uh, heat exchanger that professional brewers use. Uh, they don't use one in a garden hose like you can get uh, at a lot of homebrew shops. Um, they have a much fancier version of this. But the idea is that the wort, as it's flowing out of your brew kettle, is flowing against the current of cold water, and therefore it basically pours out of the bottom of the brew pot um, at pitching temperature. Um, this is good and it can be bad. Um, the, the, the main problem with using a counterflow wart chiller is that you have hot, sticky wart going inside a very long tube that you can never scrub out. The only way you can clean it is to flush it with, with clear water. Um, and the truth is that really isn't good enough, clean, flushing it with clear water. Um, people that I know that use immersion ch- or that use counterflow chillers ha- actually use uh, you know chemicals to clean the inside of it out with, um, and they actually uh, most of them use a pump, which is just like a professional brewer. They use something called a clean in place system at professional breweries, but these people basically use a home version of that, and they pump a cleaning solution through this chiller for 15, 20 minutes or longer and then flush it and pump cold wa- clear water through it for a long time. Um, that's really the only way to com- guarantee that it's that it's clean. Other people, I've heard people argue that you can just run boiling water through it, um, you know, fill your brew pot, bring it to boil with water, and then run it through the thing without running the counterflow. Mm-hmm. Therefore, the inside of the thing gets very, very hot. But I would... S- it's still, to me, it's a, it's a, it's all inside there. You can't ever get inside it. Um, so now the people that I know that do use a counterflow that use this kind of clean and play system make terrific beers, you know, but again, unless you have the ability to clean it thoroughly, uh, cause you won't, you can't take it apart mm-hmm. and clean it. Um, unless you have that ability, you probably are better off sticking with an immersion chiller, um, for now. And then, you know, later on, maybe upgrading to a, to a, uh, counterflow, uh, the immersion chillers are nice because, uh, as long as you keep it clean, like you, we've talked about before, when you finish with something, rinse it off, dust it off, make sure it's clean before you put it away. If you do that with your wort chiller, um, all you need to do when you use it, if you, you've got your, your beer, you're at the end of the boil, um, you can simply, uh, I, I usually always rinse it off to get any dust that might have collected on it. But that's all I do is just rinse it off, and then I, I put it in the hot boiling wort, and in essence, that boiling wort sanitizes or uh, sanitizes the outside of it, mm-hmm. um, cleaning it. Now, be careful because if there's any water trapped inside your um, immersion chiller, which is, is, is easy to do, uh, it'll start to boil and blow out the ends of the, the mm-hmm. immersion chiller. I've so usually, usually what I do <laughs> is I hook a garden hose to either end um, so that even if the water starts to boil, it's only blowing into the garden hoses. Mm-hmm. Um, and I set that in there and then... Um, uh, when I turn the, I usually let it sit in there for about 15 minutes um, to get it good and good and clean. Um, I don't always do it at a full rolling boil, but I'll put it in at the, right at the end of the boil and let it sit there for about uh, 15 minutes before I engage the water and start to pump it through mm-hmm. the coil. Um, the other thing to remember is the water that comes out the other end of the hose. Uh, you probably don't want to be spraying on your prized roses because it comes out yeah. very hot. Uh, at first, mm-hmm. um, it doesn't take long before it's just nice and warm coming out, and it probably won't hurt plants too much then. But, but that first blast of uh, water that comes through the end of it is basically almost boiling, and uh, you want you don't want to be putting that on your plants or even on the lawn. You'll end up with a little dead spot in the lawn. So I've read that some people fill their uh, their uh, washing machine, their clothes oh. washing machine, with the water from their well, that would make sense from their wort chiller if they if they 
don't want to waste that water, mm -hmm. which you, if you do run a wort chiller for 30 minutes, you're going to use a lot of water. Right, you're, and you're basically pouring it on the ground, or mm -hmm. you could water down the lawn, the drain. or so. Yeah. Uh, now, now the the um, I've looked at uh, counterflow chillers, and the thing that has kept me away from them, and I understand that there are a lot of people out there who just who use them and just love them. Yeah. Uh, is that I don't want to go to that extra effort of having to clean the inside of that of that copper mm -hmm. tube. It's just a personal preference uh, of mine, um, but that is an option for for yeah. people who want to do that. And like Work, I said, works quicker, uh, probably uses less water. True. And uh, but it's just an, it's another thing to 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 worry about clean. <laughs> <laughs> and and there are other there are other um, more expensive. Uh, um, there are other more expensive chillers out there that um, that people can buy. Right, right. But uh, it's it's one of those things that, uh, <clears throat> like a lot of the stuff, as people upgrade their equipment, uh, that's one of the things that people do is upgrade from the immersion to the counterflow. But again, you have to be prepared for how to clean it, and it, it is possible, and people do it all the time. But you you need to know how to do that, and you need to be prepared to do that. Now the the um, we talked a, a bit about in the the uh, previous episode about brew pots and you know buying a it's not necessary to have a brew pot that is big enough to do a full volume boil mm -hmm. but sure is handy uh, and I think you, you might you might get better beer uh, using that because. Uh, if you if you boil your hops in in a larger volume of water or a larger volume of wort, you get better utilization. Right. Um, you know, you all your ingredients mixed together in the boil yeah, uh, thoroughly better. pasteurized together. Mm -hmm. um, there's no mixing. Uh, one of the problems we see sometimes is a stratification in the fermenter. If they if they boil uh, three gallons plus all their extract, and then they top up in the fermenter with pre-boiled uh, water that's now chilled, those two heat, they stratify, and it's very difficult to get them to thoroughly mix together um, to the point where we, you get uh, erratic hydrometer re readings and, and things like that. So it's I prefer to boil the entire volume. Um, it's it's what I consider the best method. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's probably the way to go. You're, and you're going to need a wort chiller if you get a, a big enough For sure. <laughs> that, For a brew sure. pot that big. Because then you've got five gallons... Yeah. Of, of hot and sticky it's e stuff. Even if you wanted to try an ice bath, you can't fit it in the sink anymore. Uh, you probably have to go to a tub or a you know uh, right, a bathtub right. or something like that. Right. Um, <clears throat> and also, you can. I mean, some people if they if they get a big brew pot, they can straddle the burners on their kitchen stove so that they can use two burners at once right. uh, to fire that thing up. But if you have, if you're going to be boiling that much water, what you may want to look at is is what I characterize as you know the third tier of things. We have uh -huh. the gotta have, the the should have, and then we have the really kind of luxury items. But and they, they they certainly make the job go more smoothly. The, There's the, a reason there. Yeah, the, the propane burner, <laughs> yeah. which is what I which is what I have the the propane burner, and yeah. uh, you know brew outside and yeah. and boy it just it's like a rocket. Yeah. Firing and, up a jet engine. And it'll uh, get the water boiling quickly. That's one mm -hmm. of the problems you find uh, when you're doing the stovetop method is even if you've just got three gallons of water, it takes a long time to bring three gallons mm -hmm. of water to boil. Um, Unless you've got like a Viking stove yeah. or something like that. Uh, and I, I started out that way. I used to span burners with my enamel or pot, and it worked. Um, but uh, I also had nice little ring scorch marks on the bottom of my, <laughs> of my brew pot, too, um, because you have those red hot glowing things mm -hmm. actually touching the bottom of your brew pot um and you know you still can have scorching problems certainly with a with a, a propane fired uh burner but i've had less of a problem with that and uh back to uh i mean we talked about fermenters in the first one mm -hmm. having a second vessel for secondary fermentation is not necessary for brewing beer you can do a single stage fermentation in fact that's what i've been doing lately is single mm -hmm. stage fermentation after talking to dave logston mm -hmm. um and i'm this batch of beer i'm doing a belgian blonde 
so to speak. <laughs> wow. And does I've your got, wife know this? I've got a Belgian blonde in the bathroom back at home. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I'm, I'm going to be doing. I'm going to be racking that to a secondary because I want to have the extra time to clarify, mm-hmm. and I'm going to uh, logger it. I'm going to actually put mm-hmm. it. Uh, in some some ice and you know try to cool it down. So um, it's going to be it's going to be past two weeks mm-hmm. in the fermenter. So I'm racking it off of the primary into the secondary. Uh, so you know that's another thing that's changed um, in my brewing technique over the past year of doing the show mm-hmm. is that I was always a you know after a week in the primary got to rack to the secondary. Right. And I was talking to uh, Rick Sellers of uh, Pacific Brew News about this, and he's, you know, he's at that that at that stage right now where, you know, he's he's got to have a secondary fermenter to do beer right, but mm-hmm. you really don't have to. But this is one of those things where it's the the next step, a second fermenter. Right. Uh, you know, the truth is, you know, most people start out, you know, uh, without a secondary. They do the single what we call single stage fermentation. Um, and they they produce fine beers that way, uh, and usually the reason they they go to uh, two stage fermentation, you know, besides the fact that you can you can see it clear, you know, it, it gives you the chance to uh, get it off of the uh, the lees the the stuff that's in the bottom of the primary fermenter. But the truth is, if you don't leave it in there very long, you probably aren't running too much of a risk. You may even be you know taking some chances because every time you touch it, move it, you know, open it up you're exposing it to the elements and giving it an opportunity to get infected. Or oxidize. Or oxidize, yeah. So um, I'm I'm a two-stage guy myself. I uh, <laughs> still do the two-stage thing. I do, I don't, and I don't know whether I do it mainly so that I can see the clarification process and, 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 and manage it that way, um, or whether it's because I have a primary fermenter that I want to put back in production for mm. another, you know, batch. Uh, and then I, I I have several five gallon what I call secondary fermenters, and those um, once you once you uh, rack your beer into those and you get the uh, airlock back in, as long as you were really careful and you didn't you know didn't mess it up then, it's pretty darn safe and you can let it sit in there for quite a while um, mm. uh, without it getting any any problems or having any uh, any off uh, you know ill effects. Um, until you're ready to bottle. So that you know that <clears throat> that's just a a personal preference kind of. Yeah. You you don't want to keep it on the primary tube too long because you start to the yeast starts to die and decompose mm-hmm. and you get autolysis. Uh, kind of a it's been described as a kind of a rubber band taste. Oh. Yeah. Um, so, <clears throat> but you, it's something you you don't need a secondary fermenter, but a lot of people prefer that and. Uh, there are styles of beer like lagering. If you mm-hmm. want to lager, you're going to need a second fermenter. Right. Um, a bottling bucket is something that's also not absolutely necessary. You could even mm-hmm. bottle from your primary if you have a way to prime in the bottle mm-hmm. uh, reasonably and, and reliably, like you know some some prime tabs or yeah. priming drops. Uh, you can just bottle straight from the primary, but I still use a bottling bucket yeah. because I do the three quarter cups corn mm-hmm. sugar uh, for five gallons of water, and, and uh, I know that if I mix it in the bottling bucket, uh, I can get a good good mix. And it's just so darn handy to have a spigot on mm-hmm. the bottom of the of the, bu- of the bucket, which is essentially what it is. It's just a, a plastic five gallon food grade bucket with a spigot in the bottom. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was trying to think the other day, what did I do before then? And I think what I did was I did the primary fermentation in a white plastic bucket, mm-hmm. racked to the secondary in mm-hmm. the glass carboy, and then at bottling time racked mm-hmm. back into the primary uh, fermenter and primed at that point, and then did a siphon into with the bottle, with, the, into, with, the, with the with the bottling bottling wand. wand. And boy, that's a pain in the butt. Yeah, I can't imagine. <laughs> um, yeah. And in heavy beers, it's easy. To lose the siphon when you're doing it that way. Yeah, I, I mean, depending on how how well your hose fits to your racking cane, you could you could drive yourself crazy getting the mm-hmm. siphon started and keeping the siphon started. Um, 
And what I do is I, I keep some hose clamps around so that if I do have a leak at the where the hose meets the racking cane, I can I can crimp down on it with a with a hose clamp um, so that it doesn't bleed air there. Um, but what I t I I use a bottling bucket when I'm not using a a keg. Mm -hmm. I've used a bottling bucket pretty much from the very start of my uh, home brewing experience. And as a matter of fact, the very first home brew uh, equipment kit that I got, the fermenter came with a spigot on the bottom. Mm -hmm. And the idea was that you would use it as the bottling bucket um, afterwards. But as I described in the last uh, show, the spigots, when you use a bucket with a spigot for a fermenter, that's different from using it in a, as a bottling bucket. In the fermenter, that stuff has a chance to work in there and 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 settle in and get set in there. Um, whereas when you use it as a bottling bucket, you should be able to rinse it as soon as you're done and keep it from ever developing any any stuff in the valve and so mm -hmm. forth. Take the valve apart, rinse it out thoroughly with warm water um, right after you use it. You shouldn't have any problem with that. But yeah, um, I actually, uh, I'm, you know, we do do wines here and and beer, um, and I use it uh, when I go to bottle my wines as well. I can't imagine being able to 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 manage without one. Um, what we do is at the bottom of the spigot, we take a simple little one inch chunk of our vinyl hose, and we use that to attach the bottling wand to the bottom of the spigot. And that way. You can have it sitting um, at the edge of a counter, and you can simply take your clean bottles, stick them up, um, thread that uh, bottling cane or bottling wand into the bottle, and hold the bottle up there, kind of depressing the little nipple on the bottom of the of the, the bottling wand. Fill up your bottle, and as soon as you take it off, it stops and it's ready for the next one. Um, and it makes for an efficient process. You can you know fill it, cap it, fill it, cap it, and it goes very nicely. And I think it, we mentioned on the show before that uh, if you do that over, if you have a dishwasher and you do that over the open door of the dishwasher, if you have a spill, mm -hmm. it spills on the dishwasher door and you just close it at the end right. of the modeling session. As a done. matter of fact, uh, <laughs> on my trip I was listening to the show where you read the, the mm -hmm. letter from the guy that said he did that. Uh, and I, I mentioned that to my father and he says, yeah. I know you've been doing that since, you know, <laughs> when you first started and we have been telling our customers to do that for a long time. It's a great it's a great idea and it definitely uh works well. Uh I have down here a uh, a scale. Ah, uh, scale. A nice uh mm. digital scale where you can do ounces and fractions, tenths yeah. of an ounce and yeah, when you when you first start out, you typically round everything up to an ounce because it's the <laughs> easiest thing. You know, hops come in two ounces or whatever, and you can split it in half. And mm -hmm. uh, but I found that uh, the scale really has added a lot to uh, my brewing skills uh, when I want to do things like complex uh, hop schedules. Um, let's say instead of just doing two ounces at the start and a half an ounce at the end. You can play with a little bit and, and put a half ounce in here, here, and here, and here. Um, and that way, and, and it would be difficult to, to measure that sort of stuff without a scale. Um, same with uh, specialty grains. The truth is when you're making a five-gallon batch and you put in, uh, you know, a pound or, of, of specialty grains and two ounces of that pound is one type, let's say chocolate, and another, uh, let's say an ounce is black patent, um, you know, to misjudge that, and it would be mm. easy to do, you can put two or three ounces of black patent, you may have something you don't really want to drink um, that's just has too much of that that very dark, uh, almost bitter black patent character. Um, about black patent should probably be used pretty sparingly. Um, whereas other other grains can be used and, and are a little more forgiving if you use too much of them, but uh, some of them, uh, including like a Special B, uh, which is a Belgian specialty grain, has a very potent character, and you need to be careful when adding it, and you don't want to add it in too much. Uh, just a couple ounces is going to throw you off on the whole batch by quite a good percentage if you did the math and, and worked it all out. Um, so, yeah, you want to be careful and, and know. And, and also when you go to repeat the recipe, you want to know that, well, no, I, I know I put two ounces of this mm -hmm. in there in the last batch, and it came out great, so I'm going to do it again. And if you do small batches... Uh, it becomes True. even even more important. Uh, when we did our six pack IPA, we were measuring, you know, putting in a, a tenth of an ounce of Cascade at a time. Uh, yeah, 
So, you know, that's why I bought the scale. That's when mm -hmm. I bought the scale. Oh, okay. You know, before then, I was kind of like, you know, you sell uh, hot pellets in two-ounce jars, mm -hmm. and I would just kind of like eyeball. That right. looks like half, <laughs> you know, for a five-gallon batch or a ten-gallon mm -hmm. batch. It's not nearly as important. But, you know, if you're going to do even two-and-a-half-gallon batches or, you know, smaller batches, you really need uh, a good, reliable scale to, to measure your ingredients. Mm -hmm. And another another thing uh, on the measuring front uh, that is not necessary, and this is probably a luxury item, mm -hmm. not you know gone beyond the it's nice to or you should have it, mm -hmm. uh, is a refractometer. Ah, those are so popular now. I think part of the reason they're so popular is because there's there's some uh, inexpensive ones coming in from China now. They used to be. They were all very expensive. Two years ago, you couldn't get one for, you know, they were 80 bucks or more. Um, and uh, now you can find them all over the place for 20, 25 bucks. Uh, and I think they're all pretty much the same. They all pretty much work, I think. Although I've heard that, that you really need to be careful and calibrate and make sure that what yours says is zero, mm -hmm. really is zero. So in that, if you're going to get a refractometer, you probably already learned and to use a hydrometer, so you you should have the tool to do your to to uh, to test your refractometer, make sure that it is is true and and calibrated. Um, and they are they are a lot of fun, and it is nice to be able to take just a drop of your of your beer, put it on the slide, point it up to the up to the sky, and see a bright line, and know this is where it's at. Um, the nice thing about it is, unlike a hydrometer that is is affected by the heat of the of the wort, and you have to mathematically adjust or make sure your wort is chilled and cooled down to the appropriate temperature uh, for your hydrometer, the refractometer, while technically would be affected by heat, the fact that you use so little liquid and it's smeared out over a glass sheet, it basically dissipates all the heat immediately, mm -hmm. and so you don't have to worry about that um, so much. Uh, the problem with a refractometer is they only work on on one side of the brewing process. You can get to your original gravity, but by the time you are getting to the the terminal gravity, a bunch of your your beer is now alcohol, which is naturally thinner uh, than water, and will throw the reading off. Um, so. Uh, they are neat. They're they're especially good for uh, people that are doing all grain. Um, a couple of things that uh, all grain brewers uh, are trying to do. They they one are are usually concerned about uh, efficiency, um, so they they really want to be accurate, take good readings. But the other thing is as you are uh, as you're sparging um, and the uh, the uh, gravity of the 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 of the sparge of the of the wort that's running off. Uh, falls when it falls below a certain point, you start to extract tannins from the grains, and so you need to stop it at that point. So that's why most of the people that I know that are all grain brewers have one because they can quickly take a sample, mm -hmm. look at it, s see where they're at. Because you know, once you start the process, the, the the amount of sugar that's left in your grain bed keeps falling, and once it reaches a certain point, the pH basically there's a chemical reaction that happens and the pH rises and it starts to leach channons out and uh, so I, I like uh, I have a, a refractometer and uh, it's come in handy in a couple places the all grain uh, where you know I can I can measure the gravity quickly of my first runnings I can measure mm -hmm. the gravity of the second runnings uh, I can even take a, a spoonful of the boiling wort Set it aside, let it cool off for you know just a short period of time, mm -hmm. like you're saying, and then measure you know the gravity at that point. Right. It measures in bricks, so you've got to find a. I've got. I found a calculator online that that converts bricks to a specific gravity, so I can kind of yeah. tell you know where I am. Yeah. Uh, but also, when we were doing the six again with the six pack IPA, I you know the volume that fills the hydrometer tube. Mm -hmm. Is relatively such a big volume in that that small of a batch of beer right. that using the refractometer was really handy. Right. Just putting a drop on there instead of 
however, I don't even know how many Wasting. ounces it takes to float right. the hydrometer. And, and so now that you brought that up, we should probably point out that although I have seen people do this, I would not pour the stuff that you've used, poured into your... Uh, people will take a hydrometer, they'll fill up their hydrometer test jar or you mm-hmm. know tube, they'll float the hydrometer in it, they take their reading and then they pull the hydrometer and dump the stuff back in there in, in the, the fermenter. In the fermenter, or in the, or in their cooled wort, because oh, obviously yeah. you have to. It has to be cooled, um, so sometimes it's in the brew, cooled brew pot. But either way, you are really taking a chance there mm-hmm. when you dump something in. Now you've touched this hydrometer, you put it in there. Now you, yeah, it's just not worth it. So you don't want to reuse that. Uh, go ahead and what I usually do is. Uh, I pour it into a glass and taste it and, mm-hmm. you know, sip on it a little bit. Uh, I actually kind of enjoy a, the wort that's, you know, cooled and, and it's all ready to be fermented. It's actually quite tasty. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's usually what I do is I, I usually t- drink it. The, if, you're, if, you're, if you do, say, if you're doing an all-grain batch, say, and you take a hydrometer reading before the boil, mm-hmm. you can pour that into your boiling yeah, brew pot. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> but you're right, don't pour it into your cooled... Right. Uh, work because you're just asking for trouble. Even if you've sanitized your hydrometer, right. it's just another thing to, that touches your your chilled wort. Yeah, um, and I I know uh, people that have used uh, the refractometer. It's kind of nice because you can, uh, although you know this is one of those areas that some people d- disagree on. That uh, they will, uh, the, when they get done, they've got their fermenter full of their of their boil what they they boiled and they realize that they now only have four gallons of beer in their fermenter that is supposed to be five gallons mm. um, you can take a look at it and you know this is like I said this is one of those things um, but you can top it off if and then you can test it again and see what you don't want to do is top up to the point that you now drive the beer into an area where it's going to be thin and watery when you're mm. done. So if if you know your recipe is supposed to be in a target range, you didn't you boiled off too much water and now you're only sitting at four gallons, you can add some water to it, clean, some, some sterilized, sanitized, sterilized yeah. water. <laughs> yeah, you <laughs> boiled and chilled. <laughs> that's very important. Um, but then you can add that, mix it thir- thoroughly, take another test. I would only mix about a quarter at a time. Take another s- sample, and then you can close in on that that reading mm-hmm. you're trying to get without overshooting it. Because sometimes if you just wing it, dump in another gallon, you'll find out that no, I should have stopped at four and a half. It would have turned out perfect there. Mm-hmm. Whereas at five, five and a half gallons, you end up with something thin and watery that's not not what you wanted. And you know, like I said, it's it's not necessary, but. If you wanted to get into, if you want to piddle that much. <laughs> yeah, and it, like I said, almost everybody I know in the hobby, you know, that's that I, I consider in the hobby and not just starting out, uh, they, all my friends want one or have one. Got one for Father's Day or got one for Christmas. Um, <laughs> I got mine for Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, and it's one of those kind of cool gadgets that you can have that uh, it's kind of like a professional tool. So. <laughs> And it's, it comes with a little pouch, or mine did, that uh-huh. you can hang it around your neck. Uh-huh. So, you know. <laughs> it's mine, part came, of the, mine came with a little plastic case, part the, foam line case. Oh, yeah. It's part of the geek factor. Yep. Uh, and then another kind of luxury item uh, is the is the keg. If you want to if you want to uh-huh. keg your beer instead, if you want to ditch the bottles, uh, and I've said again and again that I'm still bottling because I just like the process. Yeah. I, I just like... It just is handy for me. Hmm. Uh, but if you're going to do the, the kegging, you probably need a re- another refrigerator. Right. Uh, and if you want a bottle uh, from your keg, you need, uh, or some people get, not necessary, but a, right. beer, a beer gun to oh. to bottle. Like a counterflow? Yeah, or a, like counter a, pressure. Counter pressure. Yeah, counter filler. pressure a filler. Uh-huh. Thing. Um, you know, some would argue that kegging really isn't a luxury item. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I keg most of my beer. Uh, just for me, it it's, makes the hobby a little more fun because I can go from a, a clear beer, uh, the clear beer in the secondary fermenter, go to a keg, and within a couple of days I can have carbonated beer. Um, there's some quirks to it, you know, uh, the the whole keg thing. As the amount of liquid in your keg falls and you get down to only a gallon or so, the, 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 the head space and the volumes of CO2 are, are different, so it's hard to keep a consistent carbonation all the way through. 
But on the other hand, it's nice to be able to just go up to the thing and pour a half a glass of beer, and, and you don't have to open a whole other beer. Um, so there's some trade-offs. But like I said, some people would argue that uh, that the kegging is the only way to go, and then bottling is just too big a nuisance. I, I, I would I wouldn't be able to stop at half a glass. Yeah, the, you. <laughs> well, you can always go get another half a glass. How can you? Yeah. Hey, honey, I'm only having half a glass here. Again. <laughs> <laughs> So it, the truth is, the truth is, the kegs tend to go pretty fast because you do a lot of that. <laughs> you feel pretty justified going and having another half glass without having to go crack open another twelve or or even a twenty-two ounce bomber. Um, it, it, it's the old joke. I've only had one glass of beer. Of course, I've refilled it seven times. <laughs> um, and you'll be uh, you'll be everybody's favorite friend if you show up with a keg at a party. That's always a good thing. <laughs> yeah. So a, a five gallon keg full of homebrew is a pretty good thing to ha- show up with at a party. So we've we've limited our our conversation to extract only. Mm. I mean, when you get into all grain, that's a whole nother wow, whole yeah. nother ball of wax. And I don't want to I don't want to uh, do that. I've taken up uh, too much of your time already. But well, you know, and the thing with with all grain is that. Uh, Kind of like we've been talking about that this hobby is very, very gadget intensive, and and we tend to actually enjoy that part of the hobby. Mm-hmm. We like that, and and uh, so as you advance into the all grain s- space, um, you 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 end up building. Most people do anyway. A lot of the equipment that the that you'll use, a lot of this equipment will be used for that. The wart chillers, the cappers, and the kegs, and that sort of stuff, and the brushes and the carboys, all that stuff is used in all grain brewing. Mm-hmm. But then there's going to be some other uh, additional equipment to, that you'll end up needing to uh, acquire or or build. Most of the time, people build them um, to get going. But then we'll we'll talk about that on another day <laughs> <laughs> with some more home brews. So, uh, or you can watch the DVD. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Because the truth yeah. is, you cover that very well in the DVD. The whole the whole thing about what you need and and different approaches to mash tons and lauder tons and all that stuff. Oh, thank you. Well, that that was fun. It uh, uh, it was fun to kind of assemble all the possible you know iterations of uh, of what you could use to to do all grain. Uh, and uh, and then you know then we demonstrate using our favorite. Uh, stuff, mm-hmm. so uh, you know, and, and everybody's got a different approach, and that's that's another thing that makes home brewing great is the flexibility and, and the creativity. You can do, you know, there are certain principles that you've got to follow, but you know, after that, it, it's really up to you to be creative and, and coming up with with your style and your way of doing it. Right. Well, thanks, Andy. I appreciate it again. Thank you, James. I always love being on the show. Well, thanks again to Andy and again to his dad, Neil, who was watching the front of the shop while Andy and I were talking back in the back. If you want to visit Andy and Neil's store online, go to thehomebrewery.com. That's thehomebrewery.com. Well, next week, uh, I'm not sure what we'll have. (laughs) It'll be a surprise to us all, I guess. I've got a couple things working, so... Uh, I'm sure it'll be great, whatever it is, and I can and I uh, really appreciate the continued uh, suggestions that I that I get uh, all the time for more shows. I appreciate the help. If you have brewing questions, show suggestions yourself, or just want to say hey, write to James at BasicBrewing.com, or just fill out the contract or contact form. It's not a contract, just a contact form on BasicBrewing.com, and please don't uh, forget to tell us where you're from. And while you're on our site, of course, you can check out our online shop where you can find great pricing on our DVDs and a combo deal to save you even more. And you can pick up a great T-shirt. It's summertime up here in the Northern Hemisphere. Time for a T-shirt, a basic brewing shirt. And we've got sizes all the way up to uh, 6X, I believe, 6 extra large. If you are interested in that, uh, in our DVDs and basic brewing introduction to extract home brewing, We walk you through the extract home brewing process step-by-step from boiling to bottling. And in basic brewing, stepping into all grain, we take you through the all grain process from milling your grain to collecting your wort. You can see a fine uh, listing of the fine folks across the country who sell our DVDs on basicbrewing.com. And if there isn't a vendor in your area, you can order it online and I will pack it 
my own darn self. Well, that's all until next week. Until then, thanks for listening. I'm James Spencer. Production help for Basic Brewing Radio and our website is provided by our good buddy in Austin, Kelly Dodson. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time. So long. (laughs) 